Now, along with pharma, your doctor will likely tell you that walking is the best medicine for PAD. And to explain why, we have exercise physiologist April Parrott with Peace Health in the Northwest. Um, April, thank you so much for being here. I think this is a, a session that everyone is actually looking forward to. Hi, um, I'm April. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist. I'm also a cardio, uh, cardiac rehab therapist. So somewhat of the same thing, but um, cardiac therapist, of course, specializes working with cardiovascular patients. Um, we just opened a PAD center at my hospital. And so this is like a new and up and coming um, option that we're doing at my hospital. And we're seeing some really amazing things happen from people getting on board with their walking program. So I think probably most of us know that um, peripheral artery disease affects our peripheral arteries that are in our legs and our feet. <clears throat> And they're affected by, our likelihood of getting these is affected by several risk factors, right? Aging, family history, diabetes, kidney, high blood pressure. Um, and one of the biggest things that you can do to improve your peripheral artery disease is address the risk factor for physical inactivity. <clears throat> so it's really hard to walk when you have PAD for a lot of folks or hard to walk for long durations. So what's the benefit of walking and how much walking is appropriate? So the benefit, one of the main benefits of, of walking specifically for peripheral artery disease patients is the building of collaterals. <clears throat> so what collaterals are is um, they are where the blood vessels, let me actually, I'm gonna share my screen. I wasn't sure if I was going to. Let's talk about these collaterals. So you have your main artery and as disease starts to develop, you start to get these blockages and the narrowing of that uh, passageway. So the collaterals, which are the vessels that are forming on the side to bypass that blockage to get blood needed to the working muscles. So how does that happen? It's really a matter of physics and it's, the, uh, it's called sheer force and it's the amount of force applied to the sides of the arterial walls just kind of if you had a flow of a river or something and um, a little stream escaped out where there was a area of that that wasn't as strong. So that's kind of how those collaterals um, are formed purely by the body's desire to get blood to those working muscles and the force that is accumulated in that. So I like to think of it in, in the mind of a tree. Um, so some of the questions that we get is like, well, can I personally, depending on where your blockages occur, can I actually develop collaterals? And it does really depend on where your blockages are at. So if you think of the analogy of a tree and you think if you block something at the trunk of the tree or say at your aorta, you know, your, your first main artery or your iliac, um, then you're just not going to get be getting enough blood to the top of the tree for the leaves to grow or for the working muscles for the toes to be healthy, right? So if there are blockages in those areas, there's not really gonna be collaterals. Collaterals are gonna form more at the tips. So if you think if you've pruned a, a, pruned a tree or a branch of a tree and all the new little branches that can then come out, but it's not gonna be down at that main trunk, right? You're not gonna just grow a new main branch off of that main trunk. Um, so those collaterals, the, um, the influence of how, how beneficial that collateral is going to be, it's going to depend on several factors. So it's going to depend on the degree of your coronary artery or coronary stenosis. Um, that is the strongest predictor. So how much plaque is actually built up in the lining of those arterial walls. And it's also going to do with the um, where that lesion, um, how proximal that that location is to other branches. Can they meet up and get the blood where it needs to go? How long have you had your symptoms? Um, and how long have you had your actual occlusion? So all of those things are gonna be predictors of how influential those, those collaterals, um, building those collaterals are gonna be for you. Um, collaterals can typically be seen after just two weeks of walking. And that's it. You start to develop those really quickly. And you think that sounds kind of like kind of 
um, amazing. Oops, I went, went too far. I'm going to back off so I can actually see my face here. Um, it, it pretty much is amazing. But if you think if you cut your finger, right, it starts to heal in a couple days. You're applying that force to the arterial walls. It's going to start to build those collaterals in a couple days and can be seen as early as two weeks. Most of the functional benefits, so your increase in walking distance, your quality of life, your overall functional capacity, those things are going to start to notice in a little bit longer. It's going to take about four to eight weeks for those improvements to start to be seen and felt. But you're gonna to continue to prove with an appropriate walking program, you're gonna to continue to improve for 12 to 24 months um, if you're diligent and following the right type of prescription. Um, so the functional benefits, I'll kind of get into that prescription in a minute, but the functional benefits are the greatest when your exercise is over 30 minutes at a time. It takes place at least three times a week. You're walking at near maximal pain, and we'll talk about how to assess what is near maximal pain, um, and that you've done it for at least six or more weeks. That's when you're going to see the greatest benefits. Um, some of the mechanisms for exercise-induced improvements, it's not fully known. Um, we do know that there's um, in the capillary beds, which are the smallest, so you have your um, main artery then you have your arterioles um, and uh, or you have your arteries, arterioles, and then you have your capillaries. And the most benefit is seen in a broader network of those capillaries where the actual oxygen exchange is happening at the muscle. So we know that there's changes in the capillary beds, they become more dense. We also um, know that the endothelial function, the inner lining of that art artery improves in function. So it improves in its elasticity and its, its ability to help deliver the blood from the, the pressure from the cardiovascular system that improves its ability to get the blood where it needs to go. Um, so, um, what is the appropriate amount of exercise for that? And what is the right amount of intensity? And what is the right amount of pain? So we use in my clinic, um, we use a scale called the claudication scale. Many of you have probably heard about that. This is the scale we like, um, starting from no pain, which you would say one, uh, to the onset, mild pain, moderate pain, and then severe. So the general prescription, if you're going to, say, go out for a walk, you are going to uh, walk until you get to three or four as far as your pain threshold goes for that cramping um, of the muscles. If we want you to stop right before you reach that level five where it's just really severe, you're going to stop, you're going to sit, you're going to relax until the pain subsides. Once that pain is subsided, you're going to get up and you're going to go again, right? So the actual prescription looks kind of like this. Essentially, walk. Um, I say greater than one time a day. It is ideal for your walking to be done in one session, but some people just don't have the physical capacity to do that. So you need to start where you're at. And if that means that you can push yourself to up to about 10 minutes, then I want you to do multiple sessions a day. I want you to rest, say, for a good 10 minutes. Maybe you feel like, and we're not talking about just the cramping at this point. We're talking about your overall physical ability, right? How, how much total exercise can you take? And if you can just do 10 minutes, great, do 10 minutes, rest for an hour or two hours, and then come back and go through this process again. But ideally, um, in one session, again, I've said this earlier, three times a week, and we want it to be 15 to 60 minutes of cumulative activity. This is the really, really important part. Um, and again, why it needs to be in one session is because our cardiovascular system is essentially always working. And unless you actually overload the system, give it more than what it's normally doing, you're not going to see adaptations, right? So if you're like, well, I walk every day for 10 minutes and nothing's changing right? Well, because you're not, it's a principle called progressive overload. If you're not continually again, improving or enhancing, making it more difficult, what you're doing, you're going to reach a plateau and you're really not going to make those advances. Kind of the same thing happens with weight loss, right? You always hear people hitting a plateau. It's like, yeah, after a certain amount of time, your body becomes accustomed to the activity and you need to step up that, um, change your diet, change your activity to continue to 
make those adaptations. So 15 to 60 minutes, um, 30 minutes or more is the most beneficial and really the more the better, what can you tolerate? So to do that, say this is a new program for you, you're unsure, you, you go through that process of uh, walking till you hit that threshold of three to four for your pain, stopping to rest. So I would set a timer and I would walk. And you're just gonna keep that, that timer running. You're gonna rest when you need to rest. When the pain subsided, you're gonna go again. And you're gonna try to get up to 15 minutes or however long you can go. And those rest periods are gonna be counted in this because the idea is over time that those rest periods are actually going to decrease. And we're looking for um, the total time of that activity. So how hard should you be walking? What, what intensity should you be walking at? And we want a, a moderate intensity. Uh, I, I hear a lot of people say with, with PAD that you want to walk briskly. Um, some people may not be able to walk briskly um, before that claudication, that pain starts to set in. So you want to kind of uh, walk a little slower to see if you can, if you see my note down at the bottom, try to find a speed that allows you to walk for five to eight minutes before claudication occurs. Now, if you can't do that, if claudication comes in two to three minutes, that's just you and that's where you're going to start and that's where you're going to work at. But think about dialing back your speed a little bit if, if walking briskly is um, just bringing on that claudication too soon. So moderate intensity, you should be breathing somewhat heavily, but you should be able to hold a short conversation. And you should be saying to yourself, I can maintain this for a while, right? This isn't too hard. Um, this feels pretty good. You could have a conversation with somebody. If you're breathy, that's just too hard. We're not looking to see absolutely how hard you can push yourself. We're looking for cardiovascular conditioning. And so that's going to come with this moderate intensity over longer periods of time. Um, so that's kind of the general, I, I did, uh, I do have a lot of prescriptions for treadmill for those of you that are interested or have access and availability to a treadmill. The prescription for a treadmill can kind of get a little bit complex. So in general, I can always come back and talk specifically about treadmill conditioning, but in general, if uh, stick to that principle of progressive overload. Like if you're like, oh, I walk 30 minutes on a treadmill and I'm fine, you know, but I get out and I try to go for a hike and my claudication kicks in, right? Well, you're probably walking harder on the hike than you are on the treadmill. So to make those adaptations, again, you need to either crank up some incline, crank up the speed a little bit until you're hitting that claudication somewhere that five to eight minutes and then going through that rest, um, pain subside, get up and walk again. So I got some questions um, I can see over here. Um, can you share your recommendation if you don't experience pain? Yeah, so if you don't experience pain, um, the idea is actually still kind of the same as far as progressively adding intensity to your workload. And intensity can come again in the way of incline. So yes, hills are absolutely okay. They're actually quite recommended. They're real in life too. Like we're looking for your quality of life to improve, not just for you to build collaterals and feel better, right? And in life there's hills. So I wanna build your functional capacity so that those feel better. Um, and so if you're not experiencing the pain, how can you up your exercise? So is that faster? Is that um, hills? Or is that just simply longer, especially if weight loss is a, grow, uh, a goal or if you're diabetic, the longer you walk, the more beneficial that walking is going to be as far as reducing, helping you reduce weight or manage your blood sugars. Um, so what exercise do you do if you can't walk more than 20 to 25 seat, feet? You walk your 20 to 25 feet first <laughs> um, and go through the same process and see if over time, if you can't get that to 30 to 35 feet and then 40 to 45 feet, you have to start where you're at. Um, and then I would also add some other things other activities, um, maybe do some sit to stands. If you have access to a recumbent bicycle or a, um, a recumbent stair stepper, they're typically called new steps, um, where it's a pushing over a cycle. Those don't help 
as much um, because there's some different mechanisms and they don't involve um, something I didn't really talk about, but you have skeletal muscle pumps that kind of help with the circulatory system in your calves. So some activities don't engage those muscles and have the same benefits, but you do have to start where you're at. And sometimes you just have to manage cardiovascularly what your ability is so that you can do more so that you can then address the peripheral artery disease. Um, I have buttock pains, walking since my bypass that I believe come from blocked internal iliac arteries. Um, reading somewhere suggested that collaterals wouldn't form around those. That's true. Yeah, the iliac is too major of an artery uh, for collaterals really to get there. It's only again in those small capillary beds. Um, yeah, so yes, there is absolutely truth to that, but there's also truth to the fact that walking is still going to be beneficial because if you improve your cardiovascular system, you're going to improve everything, right? You're still going to be improving some of the endoph endothelial function of those walls. You're also going to improve the oxidative capacity of the muscles themselves so that they become more efficient at processing the oxygen. So it, it is absolutely still beneficial. It just won't build those collaterals. Um, is it better to increase speed or incline first? We usually say to go to, to work yourself up to two miles per hour. If you're talking, referring to treadmill, you work yourself up to two miles per hour, and then you go and you address incline to about three miles per hour. And this is very general. Like I said, it gets kind of intricate as far as treadmill goes and about three miles per hour. So you work yourself up to 10% where you can handle 10% incline at two miles per hour. And then you start adding speed in again. So that's I, I that's the general prescription for that. And is there any benefit to strength training or activities like jumping rope, bike riding, and step ups? There's absolutely benefit to that, not in the form of building collaterals, but um, again, whenever you're improving your energy systems, they're all going to benefit one another because your strength system is a totally different energy system. It's called your creatine phosphate system and uses a total, it's non-oxidative, so it doesn't use oxygen, but it's hard to get up out of a chair and it's hard to go up a hill if you don't have some strength. So those things are absolutely beneficial and will also improve your quality of life. So um, those are great. Uh, jumping rope. Yeah, you're going to get some benefit in that. There could be some building of collaterals for things like that with jumping rope, but, you know, jumping rope is very age specific. It's not something I recommend um, when you become older. It can be very hard on the joints, um, but there could be some benefit to that. If doing something like that, though, it's a little bit higher intensity, it might totally reduce the amount of time that you are able to exercise. So if you're like, oh, I'm going to jump rope, but you do two minutes, you're really not doing much for your cardiovascular system. That 10 minute is kind of the, the baseline for improving cardiovascular function um, at a time. So jump rope uh, may or may not be beneficial and there's extra risk for injury. And then bike riding will also not really build much collaterals. Walking is going to be your best bet for that. Biking will absolutely build your cardiovascular function and is great for that. But there's a little bit different mechanisms that aren't happening um, because you're not requiring as much blood to those peripheral arteries because it's not weight bearing. Um, how about if you're confined to a wheelchair, is it possible to grow collaterals through some kind of yoga, foot tapping, marching, et cetera? I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I'm an eternal optimist. So I want to say that something is always better than nothing. And they've probably haven't done a lot of research as far as that goes. So I, I don't have a lot to go off of. But trying is good, um, especially when you're stretching um, and doing anything that is going to engage. So I'm going to go back to the skeletal muscle pumps. So they're in your calves. And if you squeeze a bicep, a bicep gets bigger, right? So when you flex your foot, like when you're walking, the muscles in your calves, they shorten and they kind of get a little bit wider, like, like the bicep would. And what happens is that they end up squeezing the veins and helping the blood return back to the heart. So um, doing things that activate those calf muscles help with that circulatory system. So there would absolutely be benefit to things like toe tapping um, or just stretching and flexing of those feet. 
yoga and Tai Chi, they're not going to really build collaterals. They're going to be a little bit more, um, um, mental beneficial, uh, stretching, um, for the muscular systems, but there, there's not a whole lot of cardiovascular, um, improvement for those types of things. Yeah. Any other questions? I know that's a lot and I talked kind of fast, but there's so much I've kind of like just briefly covered some of it. <laughs> yes. We so just have, um, okay. yes, of course, of course. I was just going to announce you. Yes, my name is Kevin Morgan. I appreciated your talk. I'm an Ironman distance triathlete. I'm currently 78. In uh, 2010, I diagnosed my AAA as a result of symptoms in an Ironman race. But about five years ago, I noticed in marathons, uh, in Ironman or not, I started getting numb feet. Mm -hmm. And then about three or four months later, as a routine check for the state of my stent, uh, they found I had a positive ABI that I was developing uh, popliteal PAD. And I've been managing to keep that at bay fairly well for about five years, but it definitely impairs my running. And the, the comment I want to make as a result of five years of studying the problem of running marathons and doing Ironman with pretty severe popliteal PAD, first thing I had to do, which really helped, was to reduce impact. Mm. and yeah. reduce that um, retroverse uh, preference, which will then counteract systolic pressure and stop to laugh, which would, of course, claudicate and lock up. And you go through the pain of refill. Uh, but the trouble was it caused terrible problems with my race time. I, I was used to running like a nine-minute pace. Now I'm fighting for the Florida Ironman to get a marathon 15-minute pace. And I'm getting very, very close by not stopping. And I use two medi for which biking and swimming and weight training do not seem to be a problem at all. But for right. running, it's extremely difficult and walking up hills. So people doing a walking program, I think you'd agree, incorporating uphill walking to the point that you can handle it is great. But I use two measures of my success apart from my pace which when you're used to running a Boston Marathon, a 15-minute pace is, uh, oh dear, I'm old. But anyway, <laughs> you have to put up with these things, I guess. Anyway, there's two things I listen for. One is the pain, and the pain isn't necessarily going to stop you moving, and it definitely plays a huge role in the growth of my collaterals, which have been, I've been pretty successful based on function. And the other is functionality. As soon when I'm running or walking, if I notice impaired function, then I will stop and do refill for my feet and my calves, especially the right calf. And I'll notice, especially when I'm running, that instead of, in order to reduce impact stress, I want my feet to land on the ground gently, which of course is harder at a high cadence and it's harder with a bigger stride. So I had to slowly modify my run as I did already for running with a AAA stent. And so, I've been listening, I listen to function. I listen inside my body to function. If that's impaired, I slow down and walk. If it doesn't fade, then I will have to stop, which is becoming increasingly rare. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, in order to control the pain of PAD, you have to use the pain of claudication. Pain-free movement is not gonna help you grow collaterals. So you have to use the pain as your friend but you have to listen very carefully to any impairment of function. And I'm, I estimate I can finish the Florida Ironman in about 16 hours, which means I come in you know, under 17. And the reason I continue to do Ironman at age 78 with PAD, a AAA, and more recently psoriasis, which is a pain in the neck, um, it's in order to keep my feet. And that's what I have to say. I really enjoyed your talk, by the way, and what you're doing is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Kevin is amazing. Kevin, can you give your website? Because I think that we might have some pad warriors here that might want to follow you and, you know, get some advice from you as well and, and watch your, your journey to the next Ironman. Um, yeah, it'll be kind of slow. Don't put any money or bets on me. Yeah, it's athlete <laughs> with stent. I've been writing that for about 11 years now. So it's athletewithstent.com. 
And I've been putting stuff on there on my progress of fighting PAD with Ironman training. I'm not suggesting that people try and undertake Ironman. It's not that easy. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this training for so long. For me, it's quite natural. And uh, I don't know. It's hard to get advice from doctors or have them show any interest because they, they don't have time. What I One of your speakers early on said, we have to take responsibility for our health. And your, these, speak, these talks today are excellent. They really are excellent, including the, the last speaker whose name I forget, I'm afraid. Um, and so what you're doing, Kim, is remarkable. And for me to try and talk to my personal doctor about this or even my vascular surgeon, mm -hmm. they don't have time to listen and talk about these issues. They're too detailed. They're trying to save someone else's life down the hall. So what you're doing is great, and we have to each take responsibility. And exercise, I think, is actually even more important than diet. I've been, I discovered I was a, a severe dyslipidemic back in my 30s as a result of studies in my own lab. And I think the diet helped, and I've been on a plant-based diet for a long time, exercise has helped me. I won't touch, but let's not yep. get into that. Anyway, nope. um, thanks so much. Kim, does that it, does that cover what I was going to do at the very yes. end? Yes. No, this is fantastic. I appreciate you so much. And I'm sure everyone's going to be following you. And I want you to continue to post in our network your inspiring posts because we love watching your journey. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, one question. And What's the name of your last speaker? And can April. we be connected? I'd like April. to be connected to her. April, everyone wants to connect with you. So hopefully there's a way that they can connect with you, maybe via email. Um, we are going to give her an email, April at the, um, April, do you want to give your email? Yeah, um, I'll write it in the in the comments. Perfect. But Perfect. And if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments, and there are a few more questions that were were added there. Thank you so much, April. You were fantastic. I hope you can continue to come back and um, and and work with everyone because your your talk was really inspiring and impactful. I mean no one's get, giving out this information on a daily basis when you go to a, a doctor. So um, I'm sure this is going to be played and replayed. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm open to questions and helping anybody um, kind of personalize things. I, I'm a pretty busy person, but email is good. And I promise it might not be an immediate response, but I will get back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, April. We really appreciate you.